This is Kamanzi Constable, and you're listening to Join Up Dots, my number one go-to show for inspiration and the things that I wish I would have told my younger self. Welcome to Join Up Dots, amazing conversation. Join Up Dots, get a dose of motivation. Join Up Dots, don't forget the inspiration. Yes, hello again out there in internet land, all my merry band of listeners. How are you today? I hope you're all right. Um, I'm all right because it's episode 14, so we have been live for two weeks now. No, no, honestly, hold it back, hold it back, you're too kind. I'm not worth it. I'm really not worth it. But um, today's guest is worth it because this is someone who I just knew was a person that I wanted to have on the show um, from the very beginning as she has a story to tell that I, I simply found fascinating. Like so many people in the world, this lady had a career which she balanced with being a full-time mother and wife to her beloved family. Every day she went to work as a full-time radiation oncology nurse and every evening she came back and I'm kind of guessing here probably did the same kind of things as most mothers. Uh, She dealt with the dinner, the washing and all the other things that us men try to get out of doing. But unlike many people with the same responsibilities, she didn't just play safe and continue with her career until retirement, as deep down a fire burned brightly. A fire to go out on her own and create her own business in the online world of Pinterest. But how did she convince her family that it was time for a change? How did she gain the support of her husband to make such a bold move? Well, I don't know. But back in 2012, she walked into her medical career for the last time and quite simply hasn't looked back. Although I'm going to ask her to do just that today as the powerhouse of Pinterest is ready to look back over her life to join up dots. So welcome to the show, the lovely and talented Cynthia Sanchez. How are you today, Cynthia? Hi, David. I'm doing wonderful. I just love that introduction. I really liked it. Thank you. No, you're absolutely welcome. It it has, you know, I I, I don't want to sort of push the the womanly side onto it, but I imagine there was, um, at that point of your transition, which we're going to come in later, there there was probably sort of reluctance in your heart that I'm in a career, I'm doing what I I, I trained to do, why throw it up in the air? Would that be right? Oh my goodness, 100, 1000% right, yes. So how did you sort of overcome those fears? Now, normally what I do on these kind of episodes is I, I talk a bit about your, you know, where you live and all that kind of stuff. But this was such a fundamental dot in your joining up the dot that I really thought we should cut to the chase and get to it straight away. So how did you o- overcome those fears? How did you build up to that point where you actually thought, yes, I think there's a new career for me, which actually is probably a better thing than the one I'm doing. Um, It it was a lot of soul searching quickly um, because it really did happen rather quickly. Things started changing with this blog that I started for fun um, into something more serious. And it was through conversations, you know, with my husband especially, um, that it really led me to say, yep, now is the time. Now is the time to make that choice and just go ahead and leave. Um, There were things changing in the clinic that I was working at at the time. And it was, you know, there were things going on with my family, my kids, you know, getting older and things. Um, so there was a lot of change going on. It's like, well, what's one more? You know, that's kind of been our family motto. What's one more? Um, and it, it did take a lot of thinking and and it was scary. It was absolutely terrifying to to not go back, to 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 let them know that I wouldn't be there anymore. Um, but I knew if I didn't take this chance, I, it could be a huge opportunity miss. So I just had to. So, so you're, you're laying in bed the morning of handing your cards in. And you get up and have a shower and you have your breakfast and all that kind of stuff. Or maybe you couldn't have breakfast because I can imagine you'd be <laughs> you're ch- churning a bit inside. You, you drive down to the um, t- down to the hospital or wherever you were. Was there no point at that where you thought, no, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do it? Or were you so um, tunnel visioned at that stage that it was going to happen, whatever? Oh, that morning, I was so excited. I I was so happy. I was so ready because, you know, I I gave him, you know, quite a few weeks notice. Um, So all that kind of, you know, churning and and 
anxiety kind of had a, a little, you know, a few weeks to kind of wear out a little bit and just more of the optimism and the hope and, you know, the ideal of, you know, what could be coming in the future had more time to build up. So I was excited. I was ready. I couldn't wait for that clock to, you know, at that time I was leaving at 430. I couldn't wait for that clock to chime 430. Um, I was because then that meant I was free to do everything that I wanted to do for myself, for my business, um, free to, to take care of my family, how I wanted to take care of them when I wanted to take care of them. So I, I just couldn't wait that day. Did, did you actually um, bring any of your friends, your nurses into that fold before you actually sort of um, you handed in your cards? Did you did you talk to Nurse Nelly or whatever her name would be to say, <laughs> do you realize this is what I'm going to be doing? Or did you keep it totally secret until you walked in there, jaws dropping? Oh, my God, Cynthia's leaving. Uh, no, uh, some of my coworkers did know what I was up to. They knew about the blog. Some of them even participated in it when it was just more of a, a fun kind of blog. Um, and, you know, so they kind of knew what I was up to. They, they didn't really understand it. Um, they didn't really under even understand the concept of a blog, much less a podcast. Um, so it, it was it was kind of foreign to them. And they just thought I was doing something silly online. Um, but then when they kind of got to see things change, and I started getting clients and the shift of the or the f- the focus of the blog shifted to more of a business kind of aspect of Pinterest. Um, they kind of started to take notice. What do you mean? And then uh, one of my coworkers actually started her own personal blog. Um, it, it, she has since, I guess, in, in the podcasting world, we call call it pod faded. Um, I guess she blog faded. <laughs> it didn't last very long. So many for her. people do, don't they? Yeah, yeah. Um, but but they definitely, I, you know, they they understood. They they knew about it. So where did this come from? you're going in you know as as a child was your dream to be a nurse first of all or, or was that a sort of joining up dots thing where you stumbled into it what, what was the path I actually stumbled into it um you know fortunately my family and you know my my siblings my parents my my kids we had all been very very healthy I really didn't have much experience in in the medical field um and you know aside from you know oh I broke a leg and you know in and out of the emergency room and that was it Mm. you know I really didn't you know have much exposure to nurses there are are no um, medical professionals in my family um so when I first went to college I thought it's kind of funny um I wanted to to major in marketing and, um, you know, this was this was quite a few years ago, way before Internet, way before Internet marketing and social media and that type of thing. Um, and I got into my first accounting class and I absolutely hated it. And I looked at, you know, the the courses that I was going to have to take after that. It's like, you know what, I'm just going to sit in an office all day and figure out how to make other people money. This isn't how I want to spend my life. Um, so I relooked at things and, and what I really wanted to do and what really made me happy and the experiences that I had up to that point, you know, all of being 18 years old, um, not very many up mm. to then, um, you know, I was like, what do I want to do with the rest of my life? I want to be a teacher. I love teaching. I love, you know, being around kids and seeing that light bulb go off. Um, so I thought I was going to be a teacher and shifted and, um, changed my major to, to teaching. Um, and in the, the middle of college, I met my future husband um, in October of my sophomore year of college. And by the following June, we were married. And Blimey, by the that following, was uh, that was very quick. And, and very how, quick. We, how, old, how old were you? You were like 19 at that age. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, I was 19 years old. Yeah. Um, and then soon after we got married, I got pregnant. And then soon after that, we had our first set of twins. First set of twins. First set of twins, how, yes. How many twins have you got? We've got two sets. Two sets of twins. And um, yes. boys and girls, are they mixed twins or identical um, twins? Oldest, oldest set's fraternal girls, so they do not look alike at all. And then the younger set is boy and a girl, so also fraternal, of course. So, so what is the odds in of having two sets of twins? It must be a high, lot isn't it? higher, a lot higher than I ever anticipated. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. The first set was a complete and total surprise because they weren't really twins in in our families um, until well, I didn't know there were until after you know I found out I was having twins, and they said, "Oh yeah, great grandma," but she never had them. You know, she's miscarriage. Who knows? Way back when, yeah, you know, yeah. um, you know, and that's not something you bring up over, you know, you know a dinner or something. So we, we just didn't know. And then, um, you know, we knew that there was somewhat of a risk that it would happen again. So we waited five years until we, we, we thought about maybe, maybe trying for a son. Um, but then we got the bonus girl too. So we're happy. It, it, I've, I've got five kids and 
I would have thought the, the actual having twins, everyone sort of says, oh, it's great to have twins, you get it out of the way all, all in one go. But going through it like I have for years and years and years and years, when you have one who's keeping you awake all night, but you can get them <laughs> down and grab a couple of hours, it must be terrible, really terrible to have one waking up when the other one's asleep and vice versa. It must have killed you, did it? It was exhausting. It was exhausting. I, you know, both times when they were, you know, newborn to about one or two, you really don't remember much. That part of those those periods of my life are a complete blur um, just because you are so, so sleep deprived. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, uh, fortunately, my husband and I, you know, we're, we're a good tag team. We, we, we take turns. We'd help each other. You know, we got in this together. We're getting through it together. Um, so and, and, you know, we, we got lucky with our kids. Um, they would they would be nice enough for one to sleep through while the other one was eating you know, and, and just, you know, kind of be patient and wait their turn most nights. So, um, but it was, it was exhausting, but it was, it was absolutely wonderful at the same time. But the next ones that come through, you must have gone, oh my God, <laughs> you, 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 you must have done, even putting your most positive head on Cynthia, you must have gone, yes. oh, can't we just have one? <laughs> yeah, it would be so much more fun. Yeah. But um, yeah, uh, when I found out I was pregnant with the second set, you know, my younger kids were just about to start school. Um, and uh, we went to the as soon as I found out I was pregnant, I, we had just moved to a new city, just bought a new house that was perfect for a family of four, um, too small for anything else. Um, and we said, Okay, well, maybe one baby, maybe one baby will fit in here. So as soon as I got pregnant, I called a, a doctor got an appointment right away. I need you to tell me there's just one. Um, I I went in for my appointment. They did an ultrasound right away and they saw that there were two. I started crying. My husband started laughing hysterically. Um, we just, we didn't, there was no other way to react. We just knew what was coming and, you know, we were excited and thrilled and just hope for happy, happy, healthy babies, but we knew what we were in for. Well, good on you. And it sounds like a, a lovely family unit that supports each other from, from what you've been oh, saying. Definitely. So, yes, definitely. So when, you decided, go, 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 jumping back to it, when you decided to actually, um, you know, be honest, throw it up your career into the air and see where it lands, um, the conversations that you had with your kids, how old were they at that time? Did they understand that, hang on, things are going to change fundamentally in the household? Yeah, well, actually, I've had a couple of those conversations with my kids. You know, when when we kind of started down that path of me having kids, I was still going to college to become a teacher. Well, then the kids came along. My husband had to go back in the Navy. We moved a lot. I was not able to finish my degree at that time. So I knew I wanted to finish my degree. But since we had moved so much, I was pretty much going to have to start over no matter which school I started up at again. And um, really thought about it. Do I want to be a teacher? Is that what I really want? Um, and in the process, I had been in and out of the hospital having children and having a couple of sick kids who required a lot of care. And I saw that, um, you know, there were really good nurses and there were some really bad nurses. Mm. And it made a huge difference on how I felt as a parent and as, you know, a patient and sometimes. Um, and, you know, the difference it made for me personally to have a really great nurse or a really bad nurse. And it's like, that's what I wanted to do. Um, so I, I, I like the science behind it. I like the teaching. So much of nursing is teaching. So it kind of brought it all together, my geeky, nerdy, sciencey side and the teaching side. Um, so I had to have that conversation with my kids because I went back to nursing school full time. I took classes here and there to, to work up to my nursing degree, but went back to nursing school full time when my oldest kids were, um, I guess about 12, 13. And my youngest ones were, you know, six or seven uh, or eight, I guess in that age. So yeah. they, they were old enough to understand. And I had to go back to school full time. And so I would go to their school activities with books in my lap and reading and studying, leave, you know, at the crack of dawn for, for clinical rotations and back and forth. So they understood and got to see me go through this experience of completing my education. Um, so when I came back, you know, six years later and said, you know, guess what, kids, mom's <laughs> changing things up again. <laughs> they were like, OK, here goes mom again. Um, but then they got to watch me go through this experience. And I think it's actually been a good thing for them to witness, a good thing for them to see me go through these these struggles and these these, you know, changes mm. and these adventures, you know, and, and pushing myself. They're, they're my biggest support system. Have, have you changed as a as a person? from going into Pinterest and stuff. Uh, when you look back on the person that you were nurse time, are you, because I, I imagine with like the public speaking and everything that comes out of being an online presence, you, you must fundamentally change in dramatic ways. Oh my goodness, yes, so much, so much. Um, confidence is, you know, just a hundred times more, I would say, because, you know, 
kind of the way I was raised. I was, you know, and I was a pretty shy kid growing up, really shy into, until when I had my kids, I think. And then I had to be the voice for them and I had to, to, you know, protect them and, you know, take care of them. I was, I was kind of just kind of let things happen, really passive. Um, and you know, the, you know, being a mom definitely changes that for you because you got to protect your kids, mm. you know, stand up for your family. Um, and then I had to stand up for my patients sometimes. I had to be the voice for my patients when they couldn't speak for themselves or, you know, what was best or, you know, depending on, you know, what role. I was playing at the hospital, I had to, you know, kind of sometimes confront doctors, sometimes confront family members, you know, and, and, and really, you know, do what was best for them and, you know, help people to understand why or what um, that situation was. So the, the nursing aspect definitely did help with the confidence. But when I had to take everything on my own shoulders, and this is still a, you know, kind of a, a learning process for me, I have not been doing this that long. Um, so I'm still getting out there and figuring out how to be, um, I guess, more confident and, and change my, my personality a little bit from being that shy, passive person into being somebody that's, you know, okay and having a great time speaking in front of hundreds of people. Um, and I'm, I'm really enjoying it. You know, I, I kind of had to put that fear aside really quickly and just get in and embrace it. Because it is, it's quite a different journey that I've done. I, I've come from a training environment. So I've been used for 20, 30 years of standing up in front of people and, and public speaking. And so whenever I was a best man at a wedding or, you know, father of the bride, I've been um, a couple of times, I would, mm-hmm. ju- I would just get up and do it. And it, it, it was no skin off my nose. You know, it was no sweat. I just sort of open my mouth and it all comes out. But coming on the other side of the mic has been a totally different ball game. Because it's just a different skill and you try to be your natural self, but you need to kind of move the equalizer a bit and bring up certain parts of your character which aren't there in normal life. So with you going from the nursing, you must have been playing with that graphic equalizer a lot until you found a person that you thought, yes, this is more confident, but is more close to my unique self. Would that be true? That would be very true. It, it's like, yeah, I, I love how you said it. You have to play with the equalizer just a little bit. You know, it, I, you know, when I when I get on the podcast, when I'm recording these shows, I'm like me plus 0.25 plus 0.5, you yeah, know, I, yeah. just to get that enthusiasm to come across, you know, the mic, because if I'm just if I were to relax and sit back and start talking like I would if, you know, you were here and we were having a cup of coffee, it would be more like this. And coming across the microphone, that's just that's just not good enough. You kind of have to to have a little bit more energy and a little bit more fun with it. Um, even though this is a really good conversation, you know that we're having. This isn't a formal interview. Um, you, you just, it just it, I don't know the microphone. I find the same thing with video cameras. It just kind of knocks you down just a little bit. So you have to be you plus just a smidge to to get that energy across. Yeah, I, I agree with that totally, and that's a good learning curve for anyone out there. Fake it until you make it. Just kind of pretend that you are going to be someone and generally after a while it just becomes natural even if it wasn't at the beginning Mm-hmm. definitely especially at the beginning I had you know and it's like I had to figure out and I'm still figuring out how much is too much how much is not enough you know and, and that type of thing so it's it's a process did you like like yourself on podcast well when you listen do you, do you listen back to yourself because I'll be honest and this is a, a little bit guilty secret I listen to myself a lot and <laughs> and I, I actually say to my wife, I don't know if I should be enjoying this, but I actually have been listening back to the episodes because it's still early days and we're sort of eight, um, going into sort of the unknown. But I've been listening back thinking, have I improved from episode one to episode five to episode 10? And a few of the shows, I actually forget it's me and I'm just kind of listening to the content. And because when you're recording it, you're so engrossed in the kind of technicalities and trying to think of the next question to pose, especially in this format. I've got no questions written down at all. It's just sort of as it comes out that sometimes you don't actually hear the, the, the deep meaning that the guest is coming out with and you do actually have to sit back and listen to it. But uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be honest, I like listening to myself, which is, which, <laughs> which is a crazy thing to say, really. I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, I, I like I'm 60 episodes in. Um, so every now and then I will go back and listen to episode parts of episodes, you know, one and two, and then maybe 10 and and just, yeah, I am improving. Yes. I like this. No, I don't like that. Um, unfortunately my editing skills and, and my technical skills aren't quite as advanced as you are. So I do go back and I edit 
you know, somewhat getting in the music and the intros and the outros. Um, so I do re-listen, but I find the exact same thing as you. You don't get to listen as much when you're recording them as when you go back. Um, but yeah, I, I do. I don't listen to, I mean, I, when I'm editing, I listen to each and every one, but listening to them in their entirety, I don't do that very often. Do it, do it. Like lay, lay, <laughs> lay there in bed with your headphones in, listening to yourself. There's nothing better, oh. Cynthia. Yeah, I, I I get too self critical. I'm still very I, I'm my worst critic. I'm awful. I'm awful to myself, and I got to start being better. But it's like, oh, you shouldn't have said um. You say this too much. You say that too much. You know. So but I just got to do it and enjoy it. Of course you do. Of course you do. Now, one of the things you know, the avatar of this show is really to inspire people out there who are in situations, maybe jobs that they don't like, but they can't see where to go and they can't see the big picture because, quite frankly, they're not looking in the right direction. Now, with yourself, when you first said, I'm going to go into this online world, you can't uh, possibly imagine that you would end up speaking in front of hundreds, doing a podcast and all those kind of things that come with it. What was the very first thing that actually pricked your interest and thought, yes, I'd like to do this, even if it was just a hobby at that time? Um, It was actually a podcast. Um, my family and I have, you know, enjoyed listening to podcasts for years. And um, when you have four kids, it, it's really hard to be in the car. And, you know, I live in Texas, so there's a lot of driving that happens around here. It's a big state. Mm. Um, and there's everything is far away from, you know, from anything else. Um, so when you have four kids, sometimes the only thing that they would ever agree on is a podcast. They like listening to the stories or they like, you know, hearing, you know, the they'd get into whatever the topic was of that show. Um, so one day I was in the iTunes store looking for something different to listen to and ventured over into I think just a featured section or maybe just the business section and in Pat Flynn's podcast was there staring at me it's always Um, Pat Flynn isn't it you know you know he's responsible for so much (laughs) yeah and he um it's like, what the heck is a smart passive income? You know, I have, you know, four kids that are getting ready to go to college. What am I going to do? You know, we, you know, let, 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 let's just see what it is. You know, it's going to be one of those get rich quick things. And yeah, no, I'm not going to like it, but let's give it a shot. And I just got hooked and I found that early January 20, oh my gosh, what year was that? 2012. Yeah. And, um, then by the end of January, 2012, I had my blog up. Um, and it was just at that time, yeah, just a hobby. I, I didn't understand WordPress. I didn't understand how to, you know, the HTML and CSS mm. and widgets and plugins. And, you know, it was a completely a foreign language to me at that point. Um, so it's like, well, let's start something for fun. And then maybe I'll get a good idea after I figure out the technical side of things of how I can bring my nursing career into an online business. Um, you know, how I can bring what I do for my patients into an online business. And I'm still looking for that perfect match for that because I'm, I'm always going to be a nurse. You know, that's, that's me. Um, but the, the idea that I had to start for fun was about Pinterest. At that point, Pinterest had taken over my life like nothing else had online. Um, so I started writing kind of similar to what you, you, you kind of advocate for people just to get off their backsides and do something. Uh, my, 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 the motto and the, the tagline for my site is don't just pin it, do it. Mm. Um, it's all these, these great things that you can discover and find through Pinterest. You know, it, it made me discover and, and brought me to things online that I would have never found before if I had not used Pinterest. I changed, you know, our family's menu. We, we were buying different things. We were going different places all because of Pinterest. So that's how that blog started. And, and then it just kind kind of turned into a, a business on its own almost, which then led me to the speaking and the podcast and all these crazy things. So uh, imagine I'm a complete idiot, Cynthia. What is Pinterest? Pinterest is a visual bookmarking system. Um, so you have your internet browser. Hang on, Cynthia, I've got to stop you there. Yeah, you, you, sure. s- you seem to go with the fact that I am an idiot quite quickly. <laughs> there was no imagination there. You just steam straight into it. Well, I, you know, I just I didn't hear that part. I just, I, you know, just just keep on going. And, I, and you said Pinterest and explain it to me, so I had to go into teacher mode. It was no, all about that's teaching. fine. You you go you go with it. You tell us. Um, so it's a visual bookmarking system. So if you're familiar with your internet browsers, you know you can bookmark things that you want to go back to, and it gives you this long list of sites that you could go back and look at, right? Well, Pinterest does it visually, um, and you can organize pictures that you have pinned or collected from online sources, you know, websites, blogs, that type of thing, um, into boards 
on your Pinterest account. So then when you go to those boards on your Pinterest account, you click on the picture and it takes you back to where you found it from. Um, and Pinterest is very open, very public. So if I follow you on Pinterest, kind of like, you know, we follow each other on Twitter or mm. Facebook or something like that, I can see what you have pinned. I can choose to follow all of your boards or some of your boards. So let's say you have a board about podcasting. That's obviously an interest to me. Um, so when you pin a great article or, you know, a source to, to buy my next microphone or, or whatever the case may be um, on your podcasting Pinterest board, I can then repin it from you onto my board. Now I have that link and that image on my board then that I can then go back to and, you know, either buy the, the new microphone or, or read the article or whatever the case may be. So with, with Pinterest, because I, I must admit, I haven't really looked at it well when, when you're doing anything on the online marketing world and when you're doing anything like this you, you kind of start thinking right all I need to do is do some interviews and then you suddenly realize oh god I need a Twitter account I need a Facebook account I need <laughs> all this other social media and all those things that I'll be honest with you as soon as I can afford a virtual assistant they're, they're gone I'm, I'm gonna have people take over those and, and do those kind of things because it's just not really me but um which which <laughs> which level would you say that a listener out there who's got this great idea for a business and is commuting to work every day thinking, I should try this, but I don't know how to. Is it Pinterest that they should start first or is it Facebook or is it Twitter? With your experience of online marketing, which one should they focus in for maximum effect first of all? I'm going to give you an awful, awful, awful answer. It depends. I hate that answer, but it really does depend on what kind of business they have. Um, if they have, you know, a really a, a, a business that has a strong visual base to it that they can take pictures of their products or if they're willing to be creative and create pictures or images to share online of their services or of their, you know, to promote their ebook or, or whatever kind of online business they have or physical business that they want to, you know, start, um, then Pinterest for sure. Um, just because its reach and its accessibility is so great. Um, you know, Facebook, we keep on hearing it keeps on getting knocked back and back and back. You know, you have to pay, you have to pay for ads, you have to figure out the ads, you have to set up your ads. It's, it's pretty, you know, it's getting more and more complex and a little bit more difficult to reach an audience there. Um, I still think Facebook is very valuable, but as far as just getting started, that, that could be a little bit of a challenge. Um, unless you, you happen to know somebody who is a huge influencer that can give you a leg up mm. and get started on Facebook. Um, you know, same thing with Twitter. It's, it's, you know, Twitter is a little bit more easy. Uh, you know, you don't have to have those images. It's a lot of text. So if you can just write 140 characters and, you know, get in there and start participating in conversations, it's just a little bit more time intensive, I think. Um, it is, if you have the visuals, if you're willing to do the visuals, then, then Pinterest is definitely a good place to start. It's, it's not as complex. You don't have to pay. There is no paid advertising yet. Um, so we're, it kind of is a little bit easier than those other two platforms in that way. Are you surprised how much you know? L listening to you rattle that off, <laughs> when you join up the dots and you look back over your life, and we're going to play Steve Jobs' speech in a moment because it is the sort of the, the, the moment of the show, really. But when you sit there and you can just say what you've just said, do you actually think, my God, I've been on a journey for the last two years? Or has it been something that really is about 10 years, but it's just come to the fore? Um, I think it's a journey of 40 plus years. <laughs> you don't look yeah. that old. Oh my gosh, yes, way past that, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it, it's, it's, I, you know, when you approach, when you, you know, sent me the message about being on the show and explained what it was about, um, I really, really, um, it just brought a smile to my face. I'm not sure if you remember a show, and this is really going to show my age. I think it was back in the early 90s that it was on, maybe late 80s. I forget. It's called, uh, it was a show called, um, um, connections or and it was like a PBS show or like a public television show and he just kind of connected the dots to all these important important events in history and it's like that's you know you can do that with your own life you know and and you know so I absolutely love you know what you're doing here because I think it is all those series of events that bring you to where you are now um, and you have choices along the way to to make to you know is it going to be going left or going right and you know then you look back and you can see oh yeah I took left and it's a good thing I took left mm. because if I took right maybe it go somewhere else you know because one of the things that's been coming out of all the conversations that we've been having is even if it's a dark moment in your life that has pushed you into a certain environment, when you look back, those dark moments could be the bright points. They could be the light that has actually changed your life for the better. And you can't really see, you know, as Steve Jobs said, and I'm going to play it now, actually, but you can't really see 
what are the good things? What are the bad things? What are the right decisions? What are the wrong decisions? You just need to trust, don't you? You need to trust that whatever's going to happen is going to happen for the right reason. And by trusting yourself, then there's a good chance that things are going to turn out right. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. I mean, there's, of course, extreme situations where, you know, if you chose, you know, obviously the bad choice, well, then, yeah, it's not going to turn out that great. But if you, you know, you stay true to who you are, your beliefs, your morals, ethics, all that good stuff, chances are it's going to be okay. So let's listen to Steve. Back in 2005, this is what he got up and, and spoke to a group of graduates just about leaving university, about his life. And the whole speech went on for about 15 minutes. This is just a small section of it, but it really is the, the powerhouse of the whole speech, I think. And this is the bit that I focus in on on a daily basis. This is Steve Jobs. Of course, it was impossible to connect the dots looking forward when I was in college. But it was very, very clear looking backwards 10 years later. Again, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. You have to trust in something, your gut, destiny, life, karma, whatever, because believing that the dots will connect down the road will give you the confidence to follow your heart even when it leads you off the well-worn path, and that will make all the difference. Now, I listen to that literally every day, and I, mm -hmm. I never get bored with listening to it. And I remember the very first time that it ever came into my life, and it, it has the same effect now as it did then. It's, it's truly simple words, isn't it? But absolutely spot on. Definitely. Yeah, he, he just said something really powerful there. Do you, do you think that he was sitting there shoveling in cornflakes in his mouth when he was writing it? Oh, God, I've got to do a speech later. Or, or do you think he was actually re writing it thinking this is going to be one of the most profound things that anyone has said over the last 20 years? I, I would love the cornflake scenario, I'll be honest. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that would be a, a little bit more funny. But I, I think it's somewhere in the middle. You know, I think Steve was kind of a... A serious kind of guy, you know, and I think he took whatever he did seriously, um, you know, and creatively and thoughtfully. Um, but so I think it's maybe somewhere in the middle. Weetabix. What about Weetabix then? There you go. <laughs> May not be cornflakes. <laughs> I'm going to get in there somehow. So so what are, what are your key dots, Cynthia, when you look back? Because from, from listening to you now, the thing that has struck me was when you said, one of the first things I wanted to do was be an online marketer, but you came to it before the internet, really. And now we've got so many opportunities because of the power of the computer in front of us. But you also wanted to be a teacher. And so in a way, you've come full circle, haven't you? You've joined up those dots and you've become an online teacher. Um, what were the actual key points? Was there sort of big dots in your life where you went, yes, this is actually the stepping stone that I need to take? Or was it just stumble, stumble, stumble all the way along? Um, I, I think it was just maturing and I don't know, this is kind of a weird way to say it is awakening or just opening up my eyes. Um, you know, and, and that came through having my children and watching them grow up. Um, you know, I think one of the benefits or that has happened for me having my children so early and so young, um, is that I get to really appreciate what they are experiencing and then kind of take that and, and think about that in respect to my own life. Um, you know, when I, when I decided to go back to nursing school, my, my older daughters were just about to start high school and that is a very emotional, mm. crazy time, you know, and you can see all the, the things that weigh on their mind. And as their parent, you can see, it's like, that's silly. It's not going to matter. You know, it's not going to matter in six months for them, but for them, it's everything in the world. And, you know, I kind of realized that I had done that with my own life, you know, what people expected me to do, where, where people expected me to go to school, how people expected me to work, what kind of job I should have, what kind of house I should live in. I, you know, I always was always wanted to meet societies and, you know, extended families, parents, you know, expectations of me and what they thought was right or, or acceptable. Yeah. Um, and, and that's exactly what my kids were trying to do in middle school. They were trying so hard to fit in, but still keep their identity that they were just going through all this crazy internal conflict. And it's like, whoa, that's silly. Cause you know, five years from now, you're never going to see any of these people again. It doesn't matter what they think of you right now. Um, and, and, you know, of course I didn't, you know, so I had to keep, put that in perspective for my own life. And it's like, well, I love my family and I know they love me, but does the choice of me doing this or that, or going to school or going back to work or being a stay at home mom, what does it, what does that affect their life? What impact does that have on them? None. 
that's all my life, you know. Mm. Um, I know that they, they have certain expectations and hopes for me because they love me, but I, don't, I can't live my life to please them. And I think I had done that a very, very long time. Um, and then it was, you know, seeing my kids go through all these things that he's like, no, no, you got to you got to appreciate now. And then also having the job that I did, you know, as an oncology nurse later on and as a labor and delivery nurse, even before that, um, I got to see the beginnings and the ends of a lot of different lives and how short and how precious and how valuable that is. Um, you just don't know how much longer you have and you don't know what could happen tomorrow with yourself or with a family member. So make every bit count today and, and go for those adventures. Have fun. Enjoy this life. It doesn't have to be hard or miserable. We are so, I, I feel that I am so fortunate and blessed to have the opportunity to live where I do, to have the life that I have. Um, you know, I could have been, you know, born in the middle of the jungle and, you know, starving every day. And I'm not. I live here and have all these amazing opportunities. And I think it would be just kind of wasteful for me not to take advantage of them. But you have to become aware, don't you? The very first thing you said there was, I became aware. And so many people aren't aware because they are, you know, they're, they're in contentment zone. They go to work, they do a job, they get paid, and they look forward for the weekends just so that they don't have to go to work before they start again on Monday. And life isn't too bad that they do something about it, and it's not too good that they celebrate. They just float along. And mm -hmm. I I realised, and I, I, I do, you know, I keep on saying this, we're doing a pod show, uh, podcast every single day, I am going to repeat myself. And so if anyone's listening <laughs> to every single show, they're going to hear this a lot. But m my life changed when I had a new manager come into my office who was a, you, you know, I didn't see eye to eye with this person. And I'd been doing my job for 20 years. And this person suddenly came in and was telling me how to do my job. And it just didn't sit well with me. And it was a really dark point in my life. And... It was at that moment, it was that dark dot in my life that I suddenly become aware because I suddenly thought, I can't do this anymore. I can't be more experienced at doing something than anyone else I know in this company. But then somebody comes in and tells me what to do. It just didn't sit comfortable with me. And it was that moment where it's like the eyelids opened suddenly and I started looking around. And the best place to look, you could look out the window, but you're only going to see the buses and stuff that go past. <laughs> go on the computer. Look on the computer and look at blogs and look at how people are earning a living and, and just read. And if you do it enough, then something is going to click. And then once that clicks and you start thinking about it and you start thinking about it, then you can start making your own life. And and I promise you, listeners, when you're out there, it might seem the craziest thing to do to throw it up in the air. And I wouldn't suggest you to do that in any shape or form. But if you can start spending maybe an hour every night, getting up half hour early and building something so you've got a natural transition away. Once you're out of that nine to five and you can lay in the park on a sunny afternoon because it's just a lovely day because you know, OK, I'll do my work again in the evening. It is just liberating, isn't it, Simba? It's liber liberating. Exactly. That's the perfect word to describe it, you know. And and like you said, some people are just just okay with going through the nine to five and and you know living for the weekend and that type of thing. And and I think it's just a different personality. Um, not that it's right or wrong to do what we've done or, or what they do. Um, it, it's just every every person's different. And some people are more like us that want to do these these types of things and other people are, are okay with just getting through and you know living their lives of of work and weekends and you know that that's perfectly enough for them and and they're happy with that and I say there needs to be people like that Absolutely. you know my husband is like that my husband you know he, he's still in the corporate world and you know he enjoys it and he likes he likes you know what he does um, he does right now he's like I, I don't want to be an entrepreneur. I don't want to, to do my own thing completely. I like the security and the safety of this job. I like going to work and, and you know, in this being in this type of environment. Um, but maybe someday, you know, and he, I think his plans are, you know, maybe after the kids are gone and, you know, and grown and, you know, have their own lives and there isn't as much, you know, responsibility, um, you know, in that way, then he's like, well, then maybe then. And, you know, actually what he's banking on is, is for me to, to be able to let him retire and, you know, him to just go spend time out on the golf course or on the beach or whatever and me still work in the business i think that's his ultimate goal there but we'll see that's not a bad goal to have is it <laughs> yeah he's ready to be the house husband and be taken care of <laughs> if, if you can hear me husband i don't know where you are go for it M milk yeah <laughs> milk it while you can you know you know and, and I, I would be perfectly happy with that too so but being all serious um your relationship with your husband must have gone through many different changes over the years um 
at the moment, I'm going through a huge transition, and my wife is supporting me, but she doesn't really understand it. She she mm-hmm. she says to me, "Okay, I know you're talking to people, but how are we going to pay the bills?" And I have to keep on <laughs> saying to her, "You know, <laughs> just just trust me. You know, if, if I do it well enough, and I can get an audience, everything's going to sort of be all right." But she keeps on coming back to me all the time. How long is this going to last? Like I'm I'm having mm-hmm. kind of a breakdown. When when you transitioned. Those conversations that you mentioned about right at the very beginning with your husband, there must have been more kind of convincing than a discussion at the first point, was there? Um, well, I think it kind of, in the very beginning, it started off as something for fun and then maybe someday. So he saw that part and then he saw that people were hiring me to do things for them. And so then he saw that part. So he could see kind of the progression. Um, and then things, you know, were changing and at my job and it's okay, either I find a job at a different place or, you know, I, you know, quit completely. This is what's happening here. What, what do you think? You know, he's like, I don't want you to come home miserable and exhausted and, you know, not happy from the job that you do and not fulfilled because then, you know, it shows in the rest of your day. Mm. Um, and you know, the family was feeling it, he was feeling, you know, so it's like, you know, something, yeah, something did have to change. And he's like, you know, it's going good. He did go to a conference with me. Um, we celebrated our 20th anniversary at uh, blog world at new media expo. And the last one they had in New York. How romantic. Um, I know, you know, so what, I mean, that tells you how much he's, he's supporting, supportive of me. Um, so he got to see other people, got to go to the sessions, you know, and got to get, you know, a little bit more ingrained in that world. But even six months later, he was, he was kind of where your wife was. Okay. When's this really going to do something? When's this really going to, you know, take off? And, and, and us being in this world, we know it's going to take time mm. and it's going to take building that audience. Um, because it does go against your traditional business model where you have your forecast and your projections and you have your budget and you have, you know, your spreadsheets and, and your full business plan and that type of thing. Um, it's, it's not like that. Um, you know, it, it doesn't, you don't have this widget to sell and you know, you're going to make this much profit every time you sell one, you know, the things that I'm doing don't work like that. Um, so, you know, every now and then we did have to have that, that conversation. He's like, explain to me how all this is going to work. What's going to happen? When's it going to happen? And, and then, you know, things kind of tend to pop up and, you know, I got asked to, you know, speak at this place and at that place. And, you know, now people are flying me around the world to come speak and, you know, the money's coming. So now it's making more sense. Question, last question before we go on to the very last part of the Sermon on the Mic. And it's a question that when I was listening to you, I was playing it out in my own mind about my own life. But that time when you went to Blogworld in New York, and was that the first time that your husband saw you stand up and talk in front of people? How did you feel knowing that he was there watching you? Because obviously he's, he's seen you in a totally <laughs> different way. I'll tell you why my mind was going on that. Um, I've been a trainer for years and years and years. And then suddenly my wife joined our company and I had to train her. And I found it really strange for the same reason that you had to move the equalizer and you bring certain <laughs> parts of your personality. I felt like her, she was sitting there thinking, what's he doing? Why is he being this person? This isn't the person that sort of uh, walks around the, <laughs> in his boxer shorts in the kitchen, you know. I, uh, so <laughs> how, did, did, was he surprised at how you morphed into this, this personality when you were at Blog World? Um. Well, that one was back in 2012, so I had just started. So we were both just attending at that time. He actually did not see me speak publicly in front of a big group until, oh my gosh, until New Media Expo just this past January. Um, So I spoke almost for, I guess, a full year almost, um, you know, in public at different places here locally and around the country um, until just this past January was the first time he got to see me speak in public. And it was one of my biggest, you know, presentations that I ever gave. So it was, it was, it was a little bit intimidating to have him, you know, have him there. And, and prior to that, it's like, no, don't come, Mm. you know, because I would, I would practice, you know, my presentations at home and I would watch his expression and you, you, you you know, you know, your spouse. So when his expression changed, it's like, what, what did I say wrong? What did I do? What, you know, you know, I was, I was, you know, he's like nothing. I was just sitting here, you know. But, but it's different without but, an audience, isn't it? You, you can be it is. word perfect, but once you get that audience in front of you, you kind of just raise your game. And it must be like a comedian, a comedian sitting in a room writing jokes. They're never going to be funny, are they? But get him in front of yeah. an audience and then it's a totally different ball game, and you do sort of become that different personality. 
Yeah, I became the different personality and he, you know, I was trying to read him and tr trying to gauge his reaction because I trust his reaction. And, you know, if, if I, if something was unclear, you know, in the way I explained it or presented it, I was watching for that on his face. And when his, you know, expression changed, like, oh, what did I say wrong? Because then when I present this in front of, you know, 100 people later, then I don't want to be confusing to them, you know. So um, we're, how you know, we, we kind of worked through that a little bit, how he can give me feedback without being my husband, you know, for just a few minutes. And then, you know, but now he's, he can go to my, I'm fine with it. I, I learned to look around and over him <laughs> and not be so um, focused on his, his response and, and just present as I would normally to, to an audience of, you know, primarily people I don't know, you know. So you find your unique self in the content. Yes, definitely. And that is the way to do it. Just bringing us to the very end of the show. This is the last part of the show. And this is what we like to call the Sermon on the Mic. And this is when we offer you, Cynthia, a little bit of time travel. And uh, we give you the chance of going back in time and sitting in conversation with your younger self. Now, you can choose how young this person's going to be. Um, but what kind of advice would you give the young Cynthia if you had the chance to go back and, and have a one-to-one? -one? So I'm going to play the music as I normally do. And when it fades out, I'm going to step away from the mic and I'm going to let Cynthia Sanchez give us the sermon on the mic. Here we go with the best bit of the show, the sermon on the mic, the sermon on the mic. Well, hi, Cynthia. I hope you're doing okay. You're about 15 years old, and here you are in high school, just stressed out as can be because, you know, all the other kids have this, and they're doing that, and you're not what they are. But that's okay. You are who you are. Um, and, and it's wonderful, and it's perfect. Well, maybe not perfect, but but you're good. Um, so just enjoy where you're at right now, and enjoy and try to have fun. Try not to stress so much and worry about what other people think and what other people expect. Enjoy each and every experience and opportunity that comes your way. Try to have fun. Um, get out there and don't be afraid to talk to people and ask questions. What's the worst that's going to happen when you ask somebody something or, you know, you like that cute guy, but he doesn't like you back? Oh, well, move on. There's more. Um, you're going to find a great guy in the future that's going to take care of you and be there for you and just do everything, you know, and be the one that you're looking for. So hold on and wait and just out, get out there, have fun, have as many wonderful experiences as you can because it's all going to pay off. Brilliant words of wisdom. And normally I would just say goodbye to you there, Cynthia, but there is something that I've been dying to know. I heard you on a previous podcast and you were saying that you are a bit of a sci-fi geek. And <laughs> I, I heard you say at the time that you went to the cinema with your family and you saw the Doctor Who 50th episode. We did. <laughs> now, being honest, because I watch Doctor Who a lot with my kids, I haven't got a clue what's happening. And on that episode, I was like, why is he here? Why is he there? What's happening there? <laughs> did you really understand it or did you come out going, what the hell was happening? Yeah, we. I had some questions like, well, okay, that's that doctor. But then when the new doctor comes in, who's going to be the new doctor? Yeah, yeah. And and then, yeah, I, I'm there with you. I, I have to kind of watch it all in series together to try to figure it all out. Um, I was still stuck on a couple of episodes or the season, a couple of seasons before, you know, when uh, River was on there and mm. the shooting and the knot and he was in the eye. Yeah, yeah. So some of it's still a little bit out there for me but I just go enjoy it and have a great time with it it was it was it was a fun night with the family so who's your favorite Doctor Who last question oh my gosh I don't know I just like Matt I do like Matt Smith a lot <laughs> David Tennant for me um, yeah David just got a little intense sometimes you know I like I the like fact the that you're on first side. name you're on first name with her <laughs> I am we spent a lot of time yeah. together um, you know, I, I like the playfulness of Matt. I like the that he can be serious and dark sometimes. I, I just like the range that he played where some of the other doctors kind of just seem to stick to that same character. Um, but we'll see. We'll see what happens with the next one. I'm, I'm a little bit apprehensive. I'm afraid it's going to go too dark, but we'll see. Cynthia Sanchez, it's been an absolute delight and a pleasure to have you on Join Up 
dots today. Uh, you've been so open, so generous with your time and your expertise. And um, as I say to all the guests on the show, you can always come back whenever you want because the, the basis of Join Up Dots is con connecting our history and our history is going to keep on growing. And by connecting those dots, it's the best way to build our future. Cynthia Sanchez, thank you so much. David, thank you very much. That's the end of Join Up Dots. You've heard the conversation. Now it's time for you to start taking massive action. Create your future, create your life. It's the only life you've got. And we'll be back again real soon. At join Up Dots, Join Up Dots, Join Up Dots, Join Up Dots. Join up, join up, dot.